same way they do with a hard drive so that you're not seeing the impact of it right away. But over time, it will gradually decrease the size of your memory stick as it marks blocks bad. So if we're going to look at one, one sector of a hard drive, I gave a previous speech and I went through all this content and I broke it down. This is what one sector of a hard drive looks like there on the left. You have servo data, which is the data that basically is the slice in the hard drive that says, hey, this is where I'm at. This is my geographical information. But then you'll see a lot of other things where you have to have blank space. There's this sync information, which is 14 bytes of null. It's just basically to give your head a break as it's going across. If everything was a zero and a one that it's trying to read, which is, you know, since it can't be a zero and a one, it's actually encoded, it's going to be a wave format. So the wave format looks all high. And if you don't give your hard drive a break, it doesn't know where the next piece of data is coming from. It'll just see it all as one big piece of data. So there's a number of things that are stored in there, and you can see how complex a hard drive has gotten over the years to store that data. So now we're backing up with, uh, with what we're looking at with NAND devices. With NAND devices, you have a lot less data. As you can see, you're basically just looking at a couple of flags and then maybe a reserved space that's there and some error correction data. Uh, again, because you're basically dealing with the fact that when you're writing content, it can have a problem. You've got to store some error correction data, and that's the only way you can tell if you have a bad spot, and it marks the block bad. <clears throat> the uh, status flags, basically one of the things with the status flag is that if the block is bad, it goes to the 517th location in the block, which would never have anything written to that particular sector, and it writes a FF there. And it basically, that says, I'm bad. Don't use me again. And so then that actually translates back to the block and ignores everything else from that block. <clears throat> so now I kind of want to get into a little bit of what the difference between like a flash memory stick and solid state, because you know, now that's the new hot topic. Everybody just talking about solid state disk and putting them in computers. Why couldn't we just do this with a flash memory stick before? <clears throat> the big deal is that a flash memory stick is still a very dumb device. The NAND chip itself is a dumb device. So it has to have something that tells it how to control it. So there is a chip on it, and the chip basically has some information on it. Uh, this, in a USB flash memory stick, is basically like an API type library type situation where you actually have like calls to the device and it does something with it. So all of this type of content which this particular one is for true FFS, which is a Sandus model for how to do um, wear leveling management and software management so you can talk to the device. Almost everything that's here is done physically in a driver. It is using the host machine and the content from the host machine from a processor standpoint to actually make its changes that it is responsible for what it's going to do with wear leveling and how it's going to control that and it doesn't have any intellect or processor power on its own. So you're looking at your host machine, whatever you've plugged it into to do this. Regardless of operating system or whatever else you're writing to it, you're still writing a file format or a fight fat table or whatever else you're writing to the drive. So that doesn't change from operating system to operating system. Just the content for how it manages it might change from operating system to operating system depending on driver. <clears throat> And then we move on to the SSD drive itself. Now I talked to some manufacturers and I got, I don't know if I call it completely 100% proprietary information because they like stop somewhere. Eventually you get to a spot when you're talking to a manufacturer, like you're at the beginning of a market cycle where everybody's fighting for who's going to make the best drive and what's going to make sense. And so you get so far down it and you go, hey, all right, thanks for that layout. Hey, can you tell me how that works? Uh, no, draw the line right there. That's, that's, a, that's a proprietary thing. We can't tell you about it. So I can't, you kind of stop there now. Now we're looking at you know, reverse engineering, which is really not the best thing that I do. Um, so that's always something that somebody else can step up and I'll work with you. Uh, anyway, so when you're looking at this control chip and what the difference is from a standpoint of what happens in the USB memory stick, the, the, this device is responsible for managing all the other structures that would have happened. It's emulating a hard drive. So it's going to try to manage your bad blocks. It's going to manage your device calls. And you'll notice, too, that one other thing besides that is that it's ignoring write protect calls. There are bad things that happen to operating systems and things when you typically do a write protect call. So 
you'll notice on some flash memory sticks, especially some of the older ones or now even the ones that actually you just put into your camera, there's a little lock mechanism and when you lock it, you can't write anything to it. And that's actually a, a actual hard line to the chip. It's actually a part of the chip. So that's disabled in an SSD drive. It's not there at all. So you can't write protect it or write protect the individual chip because they're taking a group of the chips and they're making all the chips one particular group. So I'm going to compare that now to what actually happens on a hard drive. Because on a hard drive over the years, we've added a bunch of stuff to it. This is not how hard drives used to be you know, 30 years ago. But now we have maintenance tracks, negative tracks, and things like that where we can actually write content. And we have all this information that's stored in this service area or the system area. Um, and those are called modules. And those, are, those could be everything from a piece of code to serial numbers, model numbers, and then we have things like the P-list and the G-list, which are bad block lists physically on the device. But one of the bigger things is smart data as well, because smart is basically telling us like every sector that goes bad and what's actually happening to our drive, and we can get some kind of feedback from it, uh, whether it's wrong or not. That's a different topic. <clears throat> and that data is stored uh, physically, like on a three and a half inch hard drive, it's stored on an outer track and it's done as what's called utility block addressing. And the utility block addressing is so that everybody can say, I only want to talk to block one or block two, and I want to read that content back, and I want to do something with it. So everybody kind of came up with a, a unified way of talking to the hard drive. But now on SSDs, we have a completely different layout, and we need completely different information. So we may not have all the same things that we had on another hard drive. So if we're asking for smart data, we may not get back what we're expecting if we get anything back at all. So I got some information that told me that this is the basic layout of what is actually done and virtualized on the chips themselves. It takes all the chips, combines them, makes one big area. And then you have your device layout. You have a header list, which is basically the whole process of doing the wear leveling moves content around, but it's still got to pretend like the block is exactly the same. So it moves the content around, but you can't find it anymore, but it knows where it is from this table. And then you have the free block list. And then the user area. And the user area is the only area that you're able to talk to. You can't get feedback from any of those other areas. All of those other areas are fairly virtualized from a standpoint of they just operate, they do what they're supposed to do, and you as an individual can't request anything or can't say, I want to go to sector 125 and actually look at it because it's being controlled by this. You have no idea what's going on. So that's a pretty important thing because this is going to change from manufacturer to manufacturer. SanDisk might not do the same thing that Samsung does for this particular layout. So if you take all the chips and you image them and you put them all together and then you try to figure out where things are, you've got to know how they're laid out. You have to have a pretty good idea of what you're looking for and what the breakdown of the content is that's on those chips in order to figure out where things are. So you can see in data recovery, that's a pretty bad thing. It's going to change it quite a bit trying to figure out where things are. So when you're looking at recovery options, this is where you know the easy button doesn't exist. Um, there is no easy button. It's a, anything that you do with trying to recover from a solid state or a USB disk is much different than doing it from a hard drive. Hard drives were hard enough as they were, but we had some options. We had some manual options because, you know, it's like cranking up a car or something. It's, a, it's manual. It's something that you can do and you can see a part and do something with it. But when it comes to SSD drives and things like that, there's not a lot you can see. So physically, you're looking at doing some similar things that you do with hard drives. Like, for instance, Dealing with hard drives, if I have multiple platters, I can move the multiple platters and I can deal with you know, the physical problem of a motor or something like that that's not working by just taking these discs out, moving them to something that does work or replace that motor and continue on with the rest of the parts, the heads, the, the PCB board and everything else. <clears throat> And I have a previous speech that was all about how to do this, and this piece was from that. So if you guys are interested in it, you can go find it. It's out on the web, YouTube, everything else. And goes into how to actually break this down and do each piece, uh, including the head replacements, which is about to come up. <clears throat> it's not quite as easy as it looks.